It's good to see your place in midwinter because I don't know how long it is since I've been here. It's, mm, yeah. It must have been in the summer or yeah. autumn at least. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe um, uh, one of the men's evenings would have come past but yes. uh, not really yeah. uh, come in. Yeah. Yeah. And when did you do your fast? When was that? That was in the new year. Yeah. So yeah, since the summer. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. of course the garden is um, has probably twice, if not three times the the leaf coverage. Um, so <laughs> yeah. in winter it feels extremely exposed. You can't just slip outside and have a pee very easily without noticing. <laughs> yeah. But in the summer it's, it's a, a jungle. Jun it's a jungle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, but what you can see in the winter is the design aspects. Yeah, you can see that a the, lot the swales are following contour, which is why they're in the annual gardens the swales are slightly curved, um, emphasizing the steps down the hill. Yeah. And so, with um, yeah, an overview of the of the land gives you a kind of sense of the design, even though the design was a an emerging design mm. over many years, mm. um, making lots and lots of mistakes. Not a typical, say, it was a blank slate, but uh, we we kind of didn't start with permaculture. We started with the problem with our food, our food system, and being really, you know, that was our kind of way in. And we mm. were very aware of you and Sue and your work, but we didn't kind of put two and two together. And also to move away from the kind of monocultural lines, we didn't have garden beds like this to start with. We had a hodgepodge of raised beds, kind of all different shapes, really mm. trying to be more sculptural all over the property. Mm, yeah. And then we realised how inefficient that actually was. Yeah, so lots of mistakes. And then as the years went past and seeing where the sun uh, rises and lands at various times of the year, enabled us and and of course the fall and, and the flow of water mm. those two fundamental things like we once we had hooked into permaculture principles we then started to redesign and not everything we had done was a mistake luckily we put the house facing north yeah and, and at the back at, uh, at, at the back block, yeah so yeah. we did some fundamental things yeah. that I, were right yeah can i also just say i'm not a fan of the word mistake <laughs> because it yeah, there's been so much learning. It's just been mm. lots of... It's been a process. It hasn't been an end yeah. result. Yeah. yeah, so that emergent design through uh, progressive incremental changes in a lot of ways is the essence of retro, retrofitting and uh, retrofitting, of course, in, in the built form and in the biological systems and, of course, the, Behavior. the behavioural because, yeah. yeah, you guys didn't come and just implement this whole thing it's it's been unfolding and yeah sometimes there's a, a step forward and a step back but mm. often it's just a, a sort of a yeah. what's the next thing to add or yeah. Yeah. and i guess for us as a couple and as a family the behavioral journey has been the most profound mm. because you know anybody can have a garden and anybody can but it's all how it interlinks and how... It's yeah, the well, community aspect. And yeah. I think that's what we turn to straight away, seeing the, the problems of the nuclear family and, mm. and that rarefication, that isolation from everything else um, hooked into these little transits to the petrol station, to the chemist, to the supermarket, um, rather than actually seeing that our food, energy and medicine resources are actually an integrated part of our environment and community is not just human but also more than human but the community garden aspect is starting to where we got together to 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 start gardening um as a community as a collective on taking over public land and that story i think that really kind of was the first big behavioral shift for us mm -hmm. outside yeah. of the house outside yeah. of moving towards a zero waste, outside of moving towards humanure toilets. But mm. I think it's the, the community aspect saying that integration and fraternity are the you know, seminal principles in permaculture. Um, and that just seemed to be the antidote um, 
to us, to, uh, the, the sharing of resources to create abundance, community abundance, rather than the hoarding uh, and isolation. So everyone has to have everything. Mm. Everyone has to have a mower. Everyone has to have a ute. Everyone has to have a, a, um, a whippersnip. Everyone has to have a chainsaw or, or a plasma television. Or everyone has to, rather than actually say, well, who's got these and who, how can we share these? Who has the tools that... Yeah. And I also think that mm. for a lot of white people, there's a, there's a lot of white guilt. There's a lot of guilt of living on stolen land and what that means. And that wanting to break down the nuclear family model was a big part of that. Mm. Having volunteers, mm. having people come and stay here, sharing, learning. Um, so we set up... Um, the School of Applied Neo-Peasantry here at Triolo yes. University <laughs> and having the community garden as well it's like that is true decolonised food because it's not under lock and key it's not private pro- private property private plots yep. it's open it's free for all it's an education space uh, in a very touristy town it's a non-commercial space and people can just go and and directly out. opposite and the supermarket, supermarket. <laughs> Yep. Yes. Exactly, but I think that's a really good point about food not being under lock and key because that's how food has been shared on this country for tens of thousands of years. And so I think becoming community gardeners was what for us was tapping into the spirit of, of economy, of local economy that has sat in on this land, in this land and been a big part of it for most of human history. Mm. And that just seems like a legacy in... To be part of mm. it, um, whereas this rarefied and, and competitive um, and isolated and separated story is is such a short um, a short story in the scheme mm. of things, and it uh, I feel like it's it doesn't sit well with us, and it doesn't sit well I think with most people. It's just how do we slowly put back the pieces to reclaim what um, our ancestors had, and mm. that is the neighbourhood. What we've found is our neighbours and having our goats in the in the community commons, following you and Sue and the, the Spring Creek model, getting goats in there, shepherding in the gullies, and uh, reducing fire risk, which brings everybody on, mm. because mm. that's the thing. Like the goats yep. bring everybody on because they're so friendly, especially if they don't get out and eat people's <laughs> roses. <laughs> but it's it's the fire mitigation because that brings together everybody from all different political. Spheres. So we have quite traditional families living here who, um, who are very excited about what the goats are doing because it's sensitively doing what they would like to probably do with their excavators. <laughs> and we call what we have here, we live in an unintentional community. Yes. And I definitely understand wanting to live in an intentional community where everybody's on the same page, but we find it very freeing and very liberating kind of more important for the work that we're trying to do is just how do we navigate difference Mm. and how do we bring people on board who might not be ready to to grow their own food or to share resources Mm. but that's also been you know having produce here to send across the road to share with neighbors here's a dozen eggs here's a jar of our honey here's some of our local um, homemade wine or whatever it is then it really starts um, just in terms of generosity generosity is contagious mm-hmm. and it's been really a beautiful thing because we're only on a quarter acre here we can only grow so much I mean we of course could grow a lot more um, but we also need to have time just to be and to parent and to do other things but to be in a gift exchange relationship with neighborhood community and people further afield who yeah who grow different things and that's been yeah a really mm. important part of our journey just the the exchanging well that's been some of the inspiration for me and sue too mm. in what you guys have have done here all of those things about the community connection and uh the the public land the mm. the common food system and the the street level uh, sense of connection seems to you know you've gone further in some of those pathways than than we have and maybe that's because we have a a larger space Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. uh, various things but in the same way that you're in 
inspired to uh, by what we've done with the the goats and on the mm. on the public land the the community scale of the influence uh, uh, of what you folks have done as the example here but doing it as you say to some extent back the other way starting in the in the, the community and that being a, a part of a process that Mm. that works from that scale back in yeah, as well yeah. as being, you know, a really, for us, uh, an important inspiration. And that, I suppose, for many years, almost decades, Sue and I didn't find that there was much of what people were doing who were younger than us was really felt out of the box inspirational or, mm. or challenging, but... Uh, your journey in this has sort of been a, a constant inspiration mm -hmm. uh, to us too. And, and of course, you know, that's why it's sort of um, in terms of uh, an example of uh, retro suburbia. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of retro suburbia, we're right on the street here. Because we're, we're in a small street, there's no hiding. And also yeah. because we don't have a car, we're constantly outside, we're walking, we're bike riding, we're constantly engaging with people. So that yeah. also brings us mm. sort of in relationship with people all the time. Yeah, and there's one of those mm. classic retro suburban templates of the, um, uh, the dead end street, which yes. actually encourages yes. all this community interaction just by its structure a bit. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. it's mostly what people have done, but it is that pattern where there's not this through traffic yeah. that yeah. sort of somehow alienates and yeah. inhibits and that yeah. interaction. Much like the 70s, uh, when I grew up in a rural suburban town, uh, kids played on the street. And because yeah. we don't have that through traffic, there's yes. always kids playing yeah. out on the street. And yeah. that's that's such a beautiful thing. And that's a classic retro-suburban uh, reclamation, isn't it? I mean, that's that's the retro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what have we lost? Yes, reclaim uh, the streets. Yeah, reclaim the streets. Yeah, exactly. which, of course, is... Has been part of bicycle activism mm. for, for for decades, and but yeah, that challenge of um, uh, as uh, David Inquick, the uh, traffic calming, uh, put the kids on the street yes. as <laughs> yeah. slow down the traffic. Yeah. That challenging idea Brilliant. of <laughs> and in um, Rob Hopkins' book, uh, from what is to what if, uh, he yeah. talks about there's a, a whole program in the UK where they block off whole streets for certain times of the week just so kids can be out there playing and there's chalk drawing and hopscotch mm. and skipping and food growing and produce exchanges and clothes swaps and and that's a like that. very small and integrative um uh behavioral change that you know just to work with a local council i mean you can do this so much with your local neighborhood mm. and in your local households of course but to work with a local council to um, to initiate such things, you know, like, I mean, we already have the precedent for closing a street for, a, say, a, a night market or a festival or something, mm. but just to do it for children's play, mm. because that's mm. of value. Yeah. That, that's, that, that sort of thing is actually very achievable within the very limited um, governance that local go government uh, uh, has. Mm. And I, I think your place illustrates that very practical design issue too that when you are producing food within intensive food gardens you know carefully espalier crops and it's actually not a suitable space for rough ball games mm, and exactly bicycles and yeah. whatever whereas the street yeah. is the perfect place yeah. for that so that idea of a robust public landscape mm. can still be food producing yeah. but uh, yeah. you know and yet the the inner garden parts are, are more um, sort of delicate and um, need more yeah. <laughs> sort of degree of care. Yeah. And so when we were thinking about <clears throat> um, setting up a bush school, uh, which we currently run one, called, run one called Forest and Free, and it's in its third iteration of the bush school. Um, so we started it when Woody was little and then we got burnt out and then we started another one and got burnt out, so this is the third time. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so we run it in the forest. We would like to have it here, but as you say, too delicate. And there's nothing, you know, the, the street is important to reclaim that in terms of kids' play, mm. but there's nothing like having kids in the forest. Mm. So we yeah. run it once a week. Uh, we run it as volunteers, and we have 20 kids who come, and mm. it's a couple of hours, and it's just so liberating. And the kids all bring their pocket knives. We have fire. They climb trees. And all the things that we may have done as kids, mm. um, but it doesn't, you can't do those things at, mm. at school anymore. And, you know, you look at the obesity rates in Australia and, of course, other places too, and kids, they're just so sedentary with their mm. screens inside, outside is scary, especially with traffic. And so, yeah, kids are drawn more inside, but to have these kids outside in the bush. There, and when we say it's a bush school, it's like, there's no schooling going on. It's, it's, it's simply getting children into forest environments. Mm. And while there are things to teach children, edible wild plants and mushrooms and the possum dray nests up in the, in the hawthorn trees and everything that we come across is a learning um, of some form. But really, these are, many of the kids that come have learning disabilities or d- difficulties at mm. school and, yet, and, and are... Uh, are given labels from the medical um, world. Yeah, we just see twenty kids, yeah. and they're all unique, and they're all neuro- neurally diverse in the most beautiful way. And the forest holds mm. even the most highest energy, uh, and in in such an incredible way. It's it's what we're dis- discovering is that for th- um, these kids who are often pathologized at school come to this school and there is nothing of they actually have a place and their parents give us the feedback that they feel like they belong they belong in their homes but they feel like they belong in a collective sense for the first time of their lives Mm. and it's really just every wednesday getting 20 kids in the forest and going for a walk and teaching them some skills and i think that's that next level out of the the experience from uh, so many school garden projects that mm. the problem kids actually are, are really good in the garden and the forest yes. mm. as you say can hold even yeah. stronger energy because it's a, a more robust tough yeah. but wild yeah. environment and, and dangerous yeah you know, the yeah, first day so. you had the good school there was a snake you know, yeah. kids got bitten by jumping jacks <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so tears many, and yes. they all came back yeah. So many black trees. It was amazing. Every week there were kids who cut themselves with their pocket knives, but that's the learning. Yeah. And yeah. we always say that we're not here to learn about the forest, we're here to learn from the forest. Mm. And, yeah. you know, we and have a creek, and the creek is our teacher, and the black birds are our mm. teacher. And well, of course, that's one of the, that's another one of the patterns in retro suburbia that we talk about the edge versus artery, exactly. and, and this yeah. in the same way with our place being in a, a small country town surrounded uh, by bush actually rather than intensive farmland Mm. there's all these fantastic edges Mm. like that you have just at the end of the street so there's this transformation from the suburban street to to the forest which of course your work in it has has made it much more accessible entry but there's that sense of the wild Mm. behind and I grew up with that and that's what I saw when we bought Meliodora, that I wanted uh, our son to have that experience of the hit, the hinterland, I called it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, there's this space further back mm. that we had as kids. And, yeah. I mean, on the Swan River, growing up in Bicton, uh, mm. the, the wild spaces that were sort of really felt to us unregulated by the adult world. Mm. And, yeah. um, that is now seems rarer because of that mm. more limited range of of children yeah. Yeah. and and also the the control the greater control over natural spaces that are managed yeah. with you know manicured spaces and rules mm. of what yeah. uh, can be and done this, this this is so we're right on the edge of the wombat state forest and suburbia yes. and the, this marginal place, which is, plays such a big role in permaculture thinking, um, I, what I've found as an adult as I've matured is 
is that the towns and cities are where our spirit resides. That's the spirit in us is in that social place. But in the forest is where our soul resides. And so to be able to have, uh, to be able to connect one spirit with one soul by being at that marginal place, I think is just, that's what I've found is a big discovery um, for myself and, and why we've been having the men's and women's circles in the forest as grief circles for those of us having going through some tough times and lighting a fire in the forest. And because it's the same with the bush school, when a bunch of adults get in the forest and light a fire and sit around it and listen to people very deeply, um, things come up that don't, that in your, your spirit town and city, where your spirit is, where your energy, mm. where your tenacity is, um, it, the soul presents itself in a forest and mm. I think that's what I see with those kids mm. that have been pathologized in in schools um, their soul is allowed to have mm. a place and mm. I think that that's just such an incredible thing that we've lost as a pupil mm. is this relationship to our spirit and our relationship to our soul and and the meeting of those things mm. I feel very grateful that we do mm. have this space here but I think about people who don't live regionally or rurally they don't have this and I still think there are lots of opportunities uh, for people who do live in the cities and the suburbs to also have these kind of rewilding experiences. Well that that is why I believe suburbia even in the, the vast tracts of suburbia around our great capital cities is that sweet point people can still go out and s sit in the backyard round a, a fire or under the stars have mm. some of those connections that are not really possible in the highly regulated mm. high density city environments yeah. where one can only partly for practical reasons mm. only work within the, the, the constraints of structures and institutions mm. and, and complex technology and energies uh, often and the, the higher density the city, the more that it is the problem. So that mm. suburbia has that uh, uh, critical mass of people that starts to get some of that mm. spirit of the city and that possibility of, of economic interaction mm. and yet the autonomy and connection to nature, mm. uh, even if it's not quite as rich as the experience that we can have here in a, a small uh, town uh, environment yeah. and uh, you know we know that means that the benefits of the great city centre are, are further away the mm. museums and yeah. art galleries and and whatever we think of the governance structures but we have this rich connection mm. with nature and I suppose permaculture really emerged at a site like this mm -hmm. on the footslopes of Mount Wellington yeah. at Bill Mollison's property yeah. where we came up with the concept in the 70s because there we were only five kilometres from the, the general post office, mm -hmm. the parliament, mm -hmm. the university, all of the structures of Western civilization mm -hmm. in the small mm -hmm. capital city of Hobart five kilometres down the road yeah. and to walk across the road from Bill Morrison's two hectare property, walk up on tracks over Mount Wellington and you are on the edge of the southwest wilderness. Mm. So mm. that enormous, like the, the two opposite worlds coming together yeah. at an edge. And I think I've said that in some ways Tasmania represented that edge between civilization and wild nature you know, and the, that's that productive edge that we talk about in permaculture at, yeah. the, at yeah. the bigger sense and we, we have it here and I, I think that contributes to us yeah. being able to go further with those processes. Mm. Yeah, and in this digital age, the edge um, is, uh, doesn't have to rely on those big uh, Western story houses of museums etc we actually like exactly. obviously uh, th that creates a kind of much more mycelial um, distribution of knowledge keeping mm. and knowledge sharing 
Um, but there's also something also about what Meg was talking about in terms of um, you know more dense urban or suburban areas that um, it costs a lot of money to keep the wild at bay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not going to have that money for that much longer. So if people are frightened of wild spaces, um, uh, you know, it, it's really a question of how much money and poisons uh, and sterilizing chemicals and um, glyphosate and, and fossil fuels do we keep throwing at the world in order to, to make it neat. Mm -hmm. Um, and while, uh, you know, this is a pretty neat garden because of the efficiency required in order to grow food, but this is, again, this connection to wilder spaces. And even the neighborhood as a social space is a wilder space because it's unintentional. We all mm. bring not the same ideolo ideology, and therefore we have to engage with a kind of, um, you know, a, a great diversity in, in the social space. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's uh, uh, the rewilding. Re I, I've called it the re-ruralisation of suburbia by just just that greater power of plants mm. and animals, uh, making it more rural, and then that element of the wild and yeah. having our own labour and that the mouths of animals being the replacement for the the machines and the poisons yeah. in managing those landscapes yeah. create that that more meaningful balance between wild and mm. civil you know what we might domestic. call civilization yeah. or yeah. or domestic yeah. domesticated uh, uh, spaces yeah and it's not like because we, we often get in dualistic arguments in Western culture about the wild and the domestic as if, you know, um, as if they're polarizing things. But I think that uh, for most of human history, I mean, the earliest um, ornamented shell is a million years old as a, as a ritual ceremonial shell. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, culture and, uh, and the wild the cultivated and the wild have had a lo much longer relationship than we probably usually give credit for. And maybe um, what I always find is that we don't need necessarily um, tons and tons and tons of wild wildness. Uh, it's actually we just need to t tap into it, whether it be uh, on our fermenting table with all those wild <laughs> microbes or whether it be a walk. Um, it just if people can have settlements that are, have access to much less human-centric spaces every day mm -hmm. so that the non-human aspect of life is foregrounded. Um, and we, we can then... Because I think one of the biggest structural problems we have is anthropocentrism in terms of everything that... How, how, how everything is structured in a global society. It's just so human-centric. And, and this is obviously... The feedback is just actually against human sin you know it, it's it, the feedback is so obviously killing everything which is what our life is based upon um forests for yeah them, so don't you water. think that the difference is there's been this discourse about that problem in environmentalism for a long time and the the importance of nature but it's actually the lived experience of Going out in the garden, yeah. your hands in the soil, so, the yeah. worms, the yeah. as you say, the ferments on the table, yeah. right through to um, the goats and yeah. you know all of those the relationships closing. ground that. Yeah. Yes, and closing the poop loop because <laughs> yeah. you know if you are eating food that uh, taking that from the garden into the table. Into the, then relieve yourself into a bucket in the bathroom and then take that into a safe composting area and then after several months that goes back into the garden. You have closed the poop loop. And yeah. so this energy... Um, so those relationships are, are both domesticated in the bucket and the, you know, the washing of the hands and all the mm, things yeah. that are great part yeah. of domestication, but they're also wild because all of the wild microbes that are actually converted and the, the worms and the... Um, sunlight and the moisture and the uh, air, the, the right ratios, all of these are wild things mm -hmm. that are then converting. 
So it's this relationship of domestic and wild in order to then put the next lot of food back on the table. And that's to live like that is exciting. It's like you you are connected. We're no longer disconnected. I mean, we started this tri- trip as um, journey. Thanks, as as very disconnected. That we we, we uh, felt, I guess, a sense of self loathing about how we were living and how what what food originless food that we were bringing to our table. It had no story. I mean, we didn't know that at the time. That's how we now think of it, but. That was that's a big thing when you know the origins of your food, that is a beautiful thing. And then before a meal we speak that. This came from such and such a farm, this came from our garden, this this was gifted by such and such. These are stories of interconnectedness. It's interesting mm. you say disconnected, because isn't that the word Victor Stephenson uses instead of talking about white people mm, and yes. his realisation that no, it's actually about people disconnected yeah. from country, disconnected. Yeah. Um, natural processes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that it's actually not to do with colour of skin. Yeah, and as an <laughs> Aboriginal man, he talks about um, not just non-Indigenous people being disconnected, but Indigenous people being yeah. con- disconnected. And so yeah. rather than actually labelling race or any other identity, it's actually looking at it from either connected or disconnected, mm. or, or a transition. So mm. that's why we call ourselves trans, because this is a long transition um, from the old story to the new, without some purest line. Of, it, it's a slow step-by-step um, movement. When you were just talking about the, um, us having that self-lo- self-loathing, I think that was when we realised maybe not in this language, but that we were disconnected, that we were, and how do we make sense of ourselves in in this context, in the world, on this land, mm. yeah, as disconnected people, and what do we need to do to reconnect? Mm. Yeah, so when Patrick and I first got together, uh, we both had full-time jobs. Um, yeah. I was working online, and Patrick was working as a builder. We both had a car, we were shopping at supermarkets, if we needed to go somewhere further afield, we would just jump on a plane. Yeah, we we were living. We weren't huge consumers, but we were definitely on the on the treadmill. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I had a credit card back in those days. Uh, I came to the relationship <laughs> with a credit card debt. <laughs> <laughs> Meg taught me how to to be live much more frugally. But I I guess I brought um, I'd been involved in my twenties in the wombat uh, forest. Um, in the wood chipping of the wombat forest, so I got involved environmentally through um, the Wombat Forest Society and in the Kennet era of logging and turning all our forests into hamburger wrappers for Japanese fast food joints. And when I, was I, like, mm. I was just going to say that pa- uh, Patrick has never really been severed from the land in that he grew up um, growing food and they had uh, potty calves and goats yeah. and yeah so this is sort of an extension of That's how you true. were brought up but I yeah. was brought up in the suburbs and I we didn't well, we grew a little bit of food but it wasn't a big part of our home economy at all mm. yeah but we did have lo- we had an acre in the suburbs which is still which is a lot wow. of space and it mm. was wild space we had wow. a massive walnut tree and Oh, oh, yeah, I didn't realise that. So that that's a, yeah, quite a... Because, yeah, these, these threads in all of our heritage that we build on or, mm. or sort of become a, a starting point or a reconnection mm. point. And I spent that, two yeah. years on a kibbutz in yes. Israel. So, yeah, when I was very, very young. Yeah. And so, of course, that is, yeah, lots of, lots of sharing. Lots of, no, there's no such thing as private property... It's all about community. Mm. Yeah. And it makes you realise that human society can be organised in all sorts of different ways. Absolutely. It's not automatic yeah. that yeah. this way that mm. we grew up with is, is the, sort of some yeah. like a law of nature. Yeah. Yeah. G'day, Woody. Hi. <laughs> where have you been? Where, where have you been? I've been at from Jando's house. Oh, yeah. Where, where's their place, isn't it? Um, it's Muscat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, So we do what we call, with Woody, unschooling. Um, Homeschooling is where you have um, the the 
the parents are basically the teachers and it's the curriculum is coming from the government and the, the kids, are, they still have classes and they still have lots of book work sitting down inside or anywhere really. Um, and so unschooling is where it's all child-led learning and yeah, we provide the, the cultural framework and the context and Woody is free inside that context just to, to yeah, augment his own learning. And what are some of the things you like to get up to, Woody? Um, really like my... So my friend's favourite thing to do is doing electrical stuff. Mm -hmm. So we make torches and wow. so I got a pair of speakers from the op shop and they didn't they didn't come with a cord that went into the wall and yeah. then it went into the speakers. So then I um so so then we um he um got the light cord and but that was the wrong voltage, so then we put a converter on it, which is, it converts the voltage, yep. the different voltage, and then um, it, it now they work. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and I think this right. is an example, like his relationship with Django and their... Django work, is six. Who's six, oh. and Woody is eight. Making and the, electric sound is when he was four years old. <laughs> <laughs> they make grinding discs, they made a, a device to beat the... They made um, this they morning pancakes. pancakes this morning, and they made a device to beat the mix together. So they had a hand and beater, and they put this a is not, on it. To do this it. is not adults teaching them. This is actually them learning themselves. Why well, say, no, why don't you put the drill on that? And <laughs> and <laughs> just spun around. Wow, did it go fast? Yeah, very fast. It only took like about 10 seconds to do it, yeah. instead of a few minutes. Yeah. But I know nothing about electrics. I don't think you know much. Uh, we're learning so much about electronics from a six and an eight year old. <laughs> and, and this is the thing. Um, so there was a, a guy, there's an evolutionary biologist called Peter Gray, who studied, uh, studied mammals, but, and particularly humans, and looked at how child mammals and child, human children learn, and it's through play. And mm. so, We've just trusted it, and um, we have an older boy who was uh, in and out of school, and some homeschooling, some traditional schooling, and it just that that was a bit confusing, I think. But with Woody, um, it, it, it's we've since then become a fully unschooled household. Mm -hmm. So, and and we're seeing the incredible benefits of it and the skills. Um, so while Woody generally get gets to choose what he does, if I'm doing the wood, he'll want to come with me because mm. he will get to use the chainsaw. Yeah. And then, so if he's been safely shown how to use a chainsaw, then I can do the splitting and the heavy work. Um, it's just, it just makes sense. So all, of the, so all the learning about tool maintenance, the forest itself, when we go into the forest, we're learning about the forest every day. Yeah. By, by being there and, and what would we take and what we leave behind for habitat. So it, it's, I think that while formal, like Meg and I both have a benefits, beneficiaries of formal schooling, that can also come later. It's more inviting the children uh, to follow their interests when I see him very active in his learning and he's, he's asking questions and absorbing knowledges of the world that he's really going to need mm. that's the other thing too about industrial forms of schooling is what we're facing in the century in the in the next 70 or 80 hopefully 90 years that you'll be alive um what skills are you going to need and i think with falling affluence with falling energy and with um all you know all the complexes of, of a changed altered climate um we're going to need much more pragmatic skills, but those that pragmatic and the intellectual are not separated. Yeah. This is this thing that, again, Victor Stephenson talks about, applied knowledge. Yeah. And so that if electronics can take junk from the op shop or from the tip and turn them into useful tools, we're going to need that. We're going to need exactly. to salvage and the to salvage recreate. economy of the future. Yeah. Incredible creativity exactly. uh, needed. Yeah. It's interesting, Woody, that... Mm. You're getting into a, a, a electronics and, and stuff that these folks don't know about because when Oliver was young, I was a really good woodworker and it was interesting that by the time he was 14, 
he was a better welder than I was. And I realized that he was moving into the metal work because I wasn't the expert always telling him <laughs> how to do it. He could just work it out himself and pretty quickly he was better than me. And that's why he's the fiddle, <laughs> fiddle player of the family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he does have two formal classes uh, a week. He, yeah. le- he has violin class um, and he chose violin when he was five as the instrument that he wanted to play and he has clay classes. So it's at our local clay cooperative. And that's with mm. a whole bunch of kids scored and unschooled. Mm. Yep. And that's the thing about the forest school too, is that most of those kids, and think, I think all of those kids go to school. So it's again, it's integration. It's just because we're unschoolers, we're not severing our ties mm. to people who go to school. We're actually building connection to school kids. And in fact, giving school kids an idea of what unschooling is like. Mm. So that there isn't this binary between yeah. us and them. There's actually connection and sharing of story think that's what's critical that and permaculture is good at that because you like you know revolution disguised as a garden a lot of people like the most popular show in australia um watch show is gardening australia so yep. so to to get something like gardening and to transform it into an economic and ecological revolution is just brilliant so <laughs> <laughs> So when we moved to this area, for me it was 15 years ago, for Patrick it was 25 years ago, um, and then we got together, I don't know, about 13 or 14 years ago, we moved on to this uh, property. I had never heard of permaculture. Oh, right. Yeah, so right. that's been, wow. and I always like to tell people that, because when they come here, they think that we're so far down the track and we've done so much, and I like yeah. to point out to people that I, I didn't have any practical skills when I moved here. Patrick did, he knew how to do lots of things, building and gardening and composting and yeah, so for me it's been a huge learning curve. Mm. And we've given up a lot of things since we moved here, since we got together. We've given up um, yeah, car travel, we've given up supermarkets, we've given up air travel, we've given up, uh, we share a mobile phone. Mm. Um, yeah, we've given out given up eating out, just sort of lots of, mm. yeah, um, consumerism just to make ourselves feel better. <laughs> um, and that's been balanced by all these rich uh, diversity of experiences yeah. and, skills, and skills, all of that enhancement. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's restraint on the one hand, as we were saying this morning, it's like it, initially it's quite a lot of restraint. But then, once the new story comes through, it is reclamation mm. and abundance yeah. in that new story. So it's not like sort of living this tight ass mm. <laughs> life. It's actually it's actually doing that initially to clip the amount of money required and the inc- economic incarceration required to to live in the old story. But then to come through into the new story, you start to build a new culture and and the story transforms into something much beyond restraint and degrowth into yep. the degrowth is important to start it off um, and the constraint is important but it's a reclamation and what you're talking about the childhood I, th- I had that growing up I, I lived along a creek and I yabbied and ate the honeysuckle nectar out of the wild honeysuckle and blackberries and you know, in many respects, uh, and my parents gardened and kept goats and potty calves and chooks and ducks. So in many respects, um, there is reclamation for me um, mm. there. Just um, and, and also wanting for Zef, um, our older boy, and Woody to, to have had a childhood like that, regardless of what they do with their, their life, to, to have a, a life connected knowing, not being frightened about the soil, actually knowing that the soil is the very thing that supports us, our life, and that connectedness. And there's so many good bacterias and um, soil communities that enrich our lives, that make our lives possible, just like the air we breathe. So it's, it's reclamation you know, yeah. rather than restraint. Mm. Yes. Yep. Woody, were you... Did you have something you were going to say about them? No. Well, he was prompting me. 
Oh, it was probably yeah. new. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If we do, we, we like to talk about the, the things that kind of started our awakening in one sense. Um, was that we had a bin with a plastic bin liner and we realised that we didn't need to use that bin liner in, anymore because we had our compost bin, all our food scraps, mm. or they were going to our chickens and ducks, worms or to zero, and we weren't buying a lot of packaging uh, in those things in packaging and a lot of it was being recycled so then we didn't need a bin liner and then yeah. we didn't need a bin <laughs> <laughs> and then just sort of step by step we've been yeah. so many things that we've realised well, we don't actually need this anymore it's amazing what we've been sold mm. like what we've been sold that you have to have to be a thoroughly decent modern human being <laughs> it's so right and what we need to be secure <laughs> and that we need to have, you know, lots of money and that that's security. You need a car and that's security. And for us, we, yeah, we don't see that, you know, of course we, we have a mortgage and we need to, we need to pay, that, mm. pay that fortnightly and we have, you know, lots of things. We have to pay rates and things like that. But for us, security is our seed bank and our, um, our cellar and our mm. wood stack mm. and our skills and knowledges. Mm. And that transition in 12 years from being 100% reliant on the monetary economy to just 25% reliant. So that's pretty yeah. much the mortgage and the rates and a few new bits and pieces. But mostly our clothes are op shop, our food we either grow or um, gift exchange or get from the local food co-op. Um, so there's a little bit of purchasing there. Uh, our energy, when, where we run at this household at two, just over two kilowatt hours a day, and the average Australian is, household is about 18, mm -hmm. and the average American household is 28 kilowatt hours a day. Yeah. So that, that showing that two, just over two kilowatts a day to say nearly 20, in the, that, that's the difference. That's the 75%. I mean, if you, in almost every system that we run in this household, we've got it down to about 25%. But um, on top of that, Patrick, the hours of occupancy here yes. and the not using the power systems yeah. in the school, yeah. in the restaurant, yeah. in the workplace, all of those other systems that are running that you're not using are actually whatever consumption, a huge proportion of it, is actually in this home. Yeah. So it's actually even bigger than that. That's true, yeah. And when and no car, and that's a that's that's a really big, big amount of energy. Yeah. And also I mm. feel like that's possible that two point four kilowatt hours is possible because of our wood oven. Mm. Yeah. Because it runs so many different appliances. It heats our home, it heats our hot water it heats, um, our, dries our food, dries our, yeah, dries our food, so dehydrator, it's our oven, it's our kettle, it's our stove top, our it's our toaster, it's our tele, <laughs> Woody's saying it's our television, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sit there and watch it. And because Patrick and Woody do the wood together, you know, that we'll look, be sitting around the fire on a cold morning and Patrick, and Woody will say, oh yeah, I remember cutting that log. <laughs> it's like, I remember that episode. <laughs> yeah. So I was asked about the, this in the subtitle of Retro Suburbia, the Downshifters Guide, and uh, choosing that word that you know I got from the studies of uh, people like Clive and Hamilton mm -hmm. that you know sort of looked at this phenomenon in a much more sort of general, modest sense, but a larger process happening in mm. society. How much do you think that describes that process that? that I mean, obviously, mm. it's a lot more than that, but, but it is a, a big example of that downshifting. It's, it's powering down. That's yeah, yeah, powering down. And I guess downshifting is often seen as you know having the big family house and the empty nesters in their retirement move. To yeah, a like very modest sort of mm. like yeah. steps of that. Yeah, and also, but, also. but I was just going to say, like, I think the the powering down or the downshifting is from the from the formal economy mm. that that's yeah. the critical thing that that is so at odds with structural um, economics um, with mainstream economics which is all about the growth of it 
it, it's just it's just bewildering. Um, I'm a poet, not an economist. Like it's bewildering how you can have permanent growth on a finite planet. <laughs> like why are we still there? And it, it, it's such a sort of short-term, um, uh, small-minded. It's not. It's not seeing the meta narrative of that at all. It's 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 in the the narrative of the day to day of the systems of the institutional systems that we've set up um, based on growth, and that's what perpetuates growth, and that's why everyone has to pre, pre, um, set them up because we've invested a lot in this theory which is flawed, but it's like the meta narrative is saying something very different, it, and the feedback of that meta narrative is is screaming at us. It's hard so, to imagine what future historians and people <laughs> <laughs> wonder. I just want to also that. say about the, down, the word downstream yeah. um, and what you were saying before, Patrick, about anthropocentrism. Yeah. And it sort of sees humanity and humans at the top. And the downshift is sort of as you see yourself as part of the world and yeah. we're just on the mm. soil and living from the earth, just like all animals, just like all, all mammals, a lot of creatures, and yeah. just that sort of downshifting to reality of that we're not up here, we're mm. actually down here with everybody else, with mm. everything else. Yep. Well, I've been to a minor place, and I can say I like its space. If I am gone and with no trace, I will.